you, Rhonda, so much for having us. We're excited. Um, my name is Emily Norlock. I am currently a physical therapist at Napa Center Los Angeles. I have been working there for what will be five years this summer. I will then be transferring to Napa's newest clinic in Austin, Texas. Erin Stranahan, the occupational therapist you'll be hearing from today, will also be transferring to Austin. Katrina Sanchez, the speech language pathologist will also that you'll also be hearing from today is from our LA program. And although we wish she was coming with us, she will be staying in LA. With all of that said, we are so excited to talk to you today about some tips on how to bring your therapy program into the home. We are known for our intensive program, which is two to five hours of therapy per day, five days per week for three weeks. And we are big on taking exercises from the clinic into the home when the intensive is complete. Currently, we have been doing telehealth with all of our patients, and we've learned a lot about what works, what doesn't, and that all of our parents have a lot of equipment at home that is really useful, even if they didn't already know it. How much time should I spend doing a home exercise program? I get this question all the time. Some parents want an exact number. However, there is no exact number. There was a research article published about children with cerebral palsy who completed a home program, including three exercises, three days per week for 18 weeks. And benefits included improved strength, improved ability to walk longer distances, improved feeling of confidence doing everyday tasks, and so if your therapist is giving you a seemingly endless list of activities to do at home, I know I'm guilty of doing that to some of my families, just pick and choose three exercises to do each day and make sure you accomplish all of them by the end of the week. You want the difficulty of the exercise to be just right too. This means posture looks good for about eight to 12 reps. If they can't do eight, it's probably too hard. And if they can keep going to 20, it's too easy. Now, when you're not doing exercise, um, make sure they're also spending time in different positions with good posture. So that might mean um, spending some quality time in a stander or a gait trainer or an activity chair or any sort of supportive equipment that you guys have in your home that may not be considered exercise, but also is a good um, piece of equipment to help them in other ways. So strength. I think this is the most obvious impairment that can be addressed with physical therapy and then carried over into the home. Strength allows the ability to hold a position and can affect balance, coordination, motor planning, and execution, all things that, are, um, that need to be in place for kids to learn how to sit and roll and crawl and stand. Um, and strength develops from head to toe, which allows the baby to gain head control upper trunk, uh, or I'm sorry, upper body trunk, and then lower body strength to be able to progress through all of the developmental milestones that you guys might be reading about in books or on the internet. So we can work muscles against gravity, which means that it's going to be harder, or we can minimize gravity and make things easier. So speaking of strength affecting balance, let's talk about balance. Your brain is getting information every second from three different systems in order to prevent a fall. Proprioception is, um, tells us our joint position in space. Vestibular gets information from our inner ear to tell us where our head position is in space. And vision, um, which is an obvious one, your eyes tell you where you are as well. Um, and these are important to note and can be challenged in every developmental position. Aaron, our occupational therapist will go into more detail on proprioception and vestibular systems later. And there are lots of diagnoses that can cause impaired proprioception, vestibular, and or vision. And as for vision, this is important to note just because you want to pay attention to what your child is visually focused on during any exercise you're doing at home or isn't focused on because that can impact their participation in what you're trying to do. So here's a bunch of different positions. And um, these are all um, ways that you can help your child at home um, learn in different ways. And um, going clockwise, starting on the top left is the position of supine. So the little girl with pink pants, she's just lying on her back. Supine is a fancy way for saying lying on your back. 
prone is a baby lying on their belly. That's the next one. Um, going down about three o'clock is that cutie just sitting with his arms out wide. Um, then we've got um, at the bottom of the clock there, the baby on her hands and knees, and that's quadruped. Not pictured here is another position that we love. Um, it's kneeling. So that would just be basically standing, but instead of on your feet, you're on your knees. And then that cute little boy is raising his hands up, he is standing. So think to yourself, is my child able to hold any or all of these positions? Maybe they can hold some, but not all. Maybe they can hold them if you give them support. What kind of support are you currently giving them? In each position, what is preventing them from holding it on their own? I would invite each one of you to get on the floor and put your body in each of these developmental positions and think about what is a normal posture. Think about what muscles you have to use, how much weight are you taking through your arms, legs, or your abs contracted? Where is your weight centered? Is it shifted forwards or backwards? You most likely will find yourself with symmetry on both right and left sides. Your head will be up and your eyes will be focused on something ahead of you. So when you position your child in one of these postures to practice, the goal is that they look like a miniature version of you. Okay, so let's talk about handling. I get this all the time. I just can't get them to look like they do in therapy, or this is a lot harder than you make it look. Well, I get these, I get these comments all the time from parents when I'm trying to teach them something, I want them to continue at home. And trust me, you're not alone. I'm not a baker, but I often find myself reading from a recipe online because that cookie that some Instagram famous baker created looks so delicious. Well, they're the professional and I don't know what I'm doing. So I do exactly what they say, step by step. And somehow, every time my cookie doesn't turn out looking the exact same as the, theirs did. It's because practice makes perfect. The more I do it, the better it, I would be at it. So yes, it does take practice to be able to get your child positioned correctly, but the more you do it, the better you will get, and the more practice your child will get in whatever position you're trying to accomplish. So where should you start with your hands? We always like to start with your hands somewhere on their trunk. So on their trunk means you have your hands on their shoulders, their abdomen, their hips. If you provide support somewhere around the trunk, are they able to hold their head up. If this is too easy and you feel like you could take your hands away, then you could try moving your hands more distally. Um, so think of the trunk as the foundation and the further you move your hands away from the trunk, down their arms or legs, the more distally you are going and the more difficult it becomes. Okay, so what kind of equipment do you need to accomplish this? Because maybe just handling on their body isn't enough. And so um, there may be some things you'll need to buy, but there are actually a lot of things that most people have lying around their home already. Since we've been doing telehealth, we've discovered a lot of ways to get creative. So a pillow, um, it can be used for all developmental positions. Supine, so remember that it's lying on your back. Um, you could place the pillow under their knees to encourage their abdominal muscles to contract. And prone, remember that's on their belly. Um, it can assist in decreasing the weight of gravity on the head if you prop the pillow underneath their chest. Um, it could help with rolling. You could prop the pillow behind their back so that they're kind of almost on their side and they can practice rolling from their back to their belly. In sitting, um, it could make the surface dynamic if they're good at just sitting on the floor. Or if sitting on the floor is too difficult and you feel like they're falling over, then you could place the pillow in their lap to support them. Um, hands, you could use a pillow in hands and knees and you could use a smaller pillow under their belly so that their arms are on the floor, their knees are on the floor and the belly is under supporting their tummy. Or I'm sorry, the pillow is supporting their tummy. Um, or you could have them crawl over it on their hands and knees to make it dynamic. If they're on their knees or standing, um, the pillow is a great tool to make the surface dynamic. So it's something wobbly, um, their ankles and their hips are being challenged to keep their body upright. A towel um, is, it can help a, 
uh, help prop a child in sideline. So if you roll it up, kind of like, like um, a little, um, like almost makes it into like a little foam roller um, looking, then you can help the child prop in sideline. Um, it, it again can be helped to prop them in prone if you place it under their chest. Um, you can practice reaching and pulling um, if you put it all the way out um, so it's no, no longer rolled up and they could practice pulling the towel or the, uh, yeah, the towel towards them in the crawling motion, or you could fold it up and, and make it look like a balance beam and you could have your child walk across it. Um, a step stool, it can be used as a chair for various sitting and reaching activities. It can be used um, in tall kneeling play. So you could place your child on their knees in front of the stool and then their arms could be propped up to help with their balance. You could use it for kids who maybe need practice going up and down. So you could have them step up and down. And you could also practice jumping down. Um, a cardboard box. Uh, <laughs> so we do a therapy called Cuevas Medic Exercises and we do a lot of stepping in and out of boxes. And so I oftentimes tell my families that they can have their child step in and out of just a cardboard box. Um, couch cushions can be used in a similar way to a pillow if that's a more appropriate height for the size of your child, um, but it can also be used like as a crawling obstacle course. You can have them jump on it, stand on that, on it, walk across it. You can get creative with your couch cushions. Um, with a ball, you can practice rolling, uh, throwing and catching. Now, if this is too difficult, Sometimes I tell my families to use a balloon or a slightly de deflated ball uh, that a lot of times makes it, the balloon moves uh, slower. So it's easier to track it visually if your child has a problem tracking um, something that's coming too fast at them. And then a slightly deflated ball also just helps as it comes into their chest, they can trap it a lot easier than a ball that bounces off of it. So, um, and a ball could also, I've used it as a dynamic surface for kids to push up to stand on. And then um, the obvious one too, kicking. Tape is a um, good tool for hand-eye coordination tasks. I use it a lot for, um, in sitting, you could have them reach. If you put a couple different colors of tape kind of around where they're sitting, you can say, you know, um, touch the pink tape, touch the blue tape. You can do the same thing in kneeling or in standing. And um, you can also use it uh, for jumping. Maybe you want, or want, um, want to work on forward and backward jumping or side to side. And then moving down to the pool noodle. The pool noodle is something that I use. It's a little bit smaller of an obstacle for crawling over. You can step over it. You can stand on it if you want to stand on something dynamic. Um, you can walk with one foot on either side of the noodle, um, the long ways. And that's great for kids with some of that scissoring muscle tone if they crisscross their feet every time they step. And then finally, one of the last things, um, a foam roller. You may or may not have this in your home, um, but it's a great tool to use um, for upper body weight bearing. So you can place your child in a plank position to work on that. Um, and upper body weight bearing is great for helping kids open up their hands um, just by creating more shoulder stability, which then in turn helps to open up hands. You can have them practice straddle sitting on the foam roller. Again, great functional stretch for kids who have that scissoring muscle tone in their legs. And then you can practice head and trunk control by shifting them side to side if they're sitting on the foam roller. Um, and then again, maybe for some of the bigger kids with some of that crisscrossing, scissoring muscle tone, you can have them walk with one foot on either side of it as well, or do some sit to stand transitions. Um, so, so these are just some of the items that I frequently use with children at various ages with varying ability levels. And you might have other equipment that you're wondering how to use it. And I'd be happy to answer any of those questions you have at the end. But for now, I'm going to turn it over to Erin Stranahan, our occupational therapist. Hello, I'm Erin. Um, I've been at Napa for about nine years now, so um, and I am happy to um, give some tips for our home programs right now. So um, the activities that I have typically been having parents complete um, for their home exercise program and right now during these telehealth sessions 
typically um, involve activities that influence their child's sensory systems, their upper body strength, their fine motor skills, and self-help skills. <clears throat> and as Emily talked to you before, just now about equipment, um, some of, my, of the equipment that I've really found helpful for our sessions include a yoga ball. Um, this can be used for upper body weight bearing in addition to providing vestibular input. I also have found various uses for the foam roller, um, including the ones that Emily had just mentioned, in addition to lots of pushing on vertical surfaces or pushing on the floor, um, incorporating them into our obstacle courses, um, holding on to the foam rollers and working on some um, crossing midline. Um, so lots of uses for the foam roller. Um, a laundry basket has also been one of my best friends as far as having our children um, push the basket, attaching a rope and having them pull. Um, I've had some families create at Napa, we love, a lot of our kids love the ball pit. So I've had some families make their own kind of makeshift ball pit using the laundry basket and tossing some stuffed animals in there or lining it with a, a sheet and putting some um, dried beans in there. Um, also, I've incorporated laundry baskets into a lot of the obstacle courses or uh, transition transitioning surfaces, um, pillows, as Emily mentioned, um, blankets have been great for providing vestibular input, and I'll go into that in just a moment, um, shaving cream, water bottles have been great as far as I've used them for as cones, I've used them as um, bowling pins, um, targets, so lots of uses for water bottles, um, scooter boards, had a lot of different um, uses for scooter boards, either to provide that vestibular input, um, get some upper body strength, some core strength. Um, chip clips and clothespins have been great. And also some of our uh, tactile textures, such as dried rice, pasta, beans, um, cooked, cooked noodles, dry noodles, et cetera. And so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the vestibular system. Um, so a lot of families will say that, oh, I notice in the clinic, we do a lot of swinging. How can I provide that input to my child if we don't have a swing? Um, so the vestibular system is important for posture, balance, coordination, visual development, auditory processing, and regulation of the nervous system. It tells us where our body is in space, how it is moving through space, stabilizes our head and body with movement. Um, and what I tell parents is we can provide this input using our own bodies, so we, you don't need a swing, um, using our own bodies and moving the child's body through space by encouraging changes in head position and body position and by using dynamic equipment. Um, so that could include a swing, but there's also various other pieces of equipment, including um, the scooter board, as mentioned, a, um, a yoga ball, um, a blanket, and I'll go into that in just a moment. Um, and this movement can be in a variety of different planes. It can be movement side to side, front to back, up and down, and rotary, meaning kind of spinning round and round. And so different ways that I'll tell families that we can provide this type of input. Um, include rocking or bouncing your child in your arms. So we'll play games and sing songs such as row, row, row your boat. Um, you can lift your child into the air and tipping them side to side or simply just inverting their head. Um, this is a, a, a common one is creating a blanket swing. So if your child really enjoys swinging, um, you and another person can hold four corners of a blanket and swing side to side and you can change up the speed and the direction of the movement to change the input. Another popular one is creating a sleigh ride. So you can use that laundry basket or just a blanket and place your child on the towel blanket or laundry basket and pull them across the floor. Um, this tends to be really fun. Um, and they have siblings. Sometimes siblings really enjoy um, playing this game. Um, rocking in a rocking chair or rocking horse, using a yoga ball so you can place your child in various positions. They can be uh, sitting on their bottom, on their tummy, on their back, and you can rock or bounce them. And you can make the movement as little as you need, do a little tiny 
small movements or you can make this movement faster and vigorous and kind of see how your child responds to the input and the movement. Um, also moving on a scooter board, sitting or standing on a BOSU ball, um, having them sit on a rolling desk chair or on a trampoline, all those all the pieces of equipment that are somewhat dynamic and provide some movement are your influencing their vestibular systems. Um, also just simply swaying or dancing with your child while listening to music. Um, so that can be a fun activity to do um, you know, while you're making dinner or something like that. Um, and a fav another favorite is rolling your child up in a blanket uh, like a burrito. So we'll just kind of put them right uh, at one end of a towel or blanket and you can roll them up nice and tight. Some of the um, kiddos also really enjoy that deep pressure that rolling them up, rolling them up nice and tight creates. Um, and then some kids even really enjoy being unraveled rather quickly. And that's going to provide a lot of more intense input as well. And so then we also get a lot of questions about how can I provide my child with more proprioceptive input. So our proprioceptive system tells us where our body is in space. Uh, we have receptors in our muscles, joints, and skin that provide input to our brain to let us know our body position. It tells us the effort of our movements and the force used of our actions. It also helps us to process vestibular input and tactile input, and it promotes increased attention, it modulates arousal, and can decrease defensiveness. And we can provide this input in a variety of ways. So we can provide this input using whole body movement, which would include pushing, pulling, lifting, crashing, moving, um, any time points are kind of compressed together or have some traction to it. Um, we can also provide this input by using our hands. So we can provide this by squeezing, pinching, twisting, and we also get this type of input um, with oral actions such as chewing, sucking, and blowing. So some of the ways that I like to tell families that they can provide this input include administering joint compressions. So this entails placing your hand above and below um, each of their major joints and then providing, usually we shoot for around 10 quick kind of oscillations, um, compressing the joints together. Um, this is a great activity to do prior to um, starting at kind of a good prep activity at the start of your um, home program. Um, also, I like to have families um, provide joint compressions or uh, a deep pressure massage right before bedtime as it does tend to be um, rather calming, so especially if your child has a harder time kind of falling asleep at night. Um, crashing into a beanbag chair, a stack of pillows, or a crash pad. Um, giving big bear hugs, carrying groceries, carrying books, or a weighted stuffed animal. Um, pushing a laundry basket, pushing or pulling a wagon, playing tug of war, uh, pushing a ball or pillow off the child's body, wrestling with your child. Um, I like to create different obstacle courses, and we can use pillows in various surfaces. So using a variety of different um, furniture that you have in your home. Um, we can do some climbing over and climbing under the different furniture to provide more resistance. Um, another favorite is rolling a yoga ball over the child's body or making a sand or sandwiching their body between pillows or cushions. Um, so in this case, I'll have the child lay down and I'll have the parent place the yoga ball or pillows on top of the child's body and actually kind of lean in and provide a fair amount of pressure into the child's body. Um, and for them, it tends to be kind of like us getting a nice massage, it tends to be very um, calming and relaxing. Um, so then as far as the hands, before I talked a little bit about kind of pulling and twisting and pinching and squeezing, um, so playing with resistive items such as clothespins, spray bottles, Theraputty, Play-Doh, um, making cookies and kind of playing with the cookie dough, so anything that's going to give a little bit more um, resistance to their hands. Um, using weighted or compression garments such as a compression vest, weighted blanket, or weighted stuffed animal. And then other things that we can do for um, some more oral activities include um, sucking through straws. So in particular, if you have, um, if your child could suck through a straw and um, you can try some smoothies or I'll have some parents um, have them actually suck um, yogurt or pudding through a straw just to give that extra input. Um, 
And if you're talking blow through a straw, we'll work. There's a ton of different fun um, blowing games um, that you can do, like races and um, incorporating pom poms and tissue paper and things like that. Um, and you can also chew on crunchy or chewy foods, such as like beef jerky, licorice, um, dried fruit, uh, and such. Um, and then you can also do some blowing bubbles, some pinwheels, or any musical toys such as kazoos. Um, so another area that we tend to get a lot of questions about is our self-help skills. So this could include um, feeding, dressing, grooming, and toileting. And for a lot of these, um, you know, we try to make them as, as fun as possible. Um, so a lot of our families really enjoy for self-feeding, just kind of working on um, addressing these skills by playing in sensory bins. So a lot of times I'll have family fill, sense to fill bins or trays with dried rice, beans, or shaving cream, and really encourage their children to move their hands around the medium. Um, and it's, you can also increase the challenge by including measuring cups, spoons, shovels, and funnels to encourage scooping and pouring and maintaining a grasp on, um, on a utensil. Um, you also get a, a lot of nice, um, not only grasping, but a lot of that um, wrist and forearm movement with, involved for, with, um, with scooping and pouring. Um, and then I, I like to tell families to encourage self-feeding um, by providing your child with his or her own spoon during mealtime. Allow them to dip their utensil into the container and it's okay if they make a mess. Um, one tool that I found has been very helpful is uh, the easy hold, which kind of just goes right around the child's hand and um, and you can attach it to a variety of different um, utensils or spoons. And so a lot of families have found that really helpful if they have that so that the, the child can maintain the grasp on their um, utensil and then it makes it fun for them to kind of dip and and play around with kind of bring it to their mouth and um, and bring it back to the their food. Um, we can use clothespins or stickers and place them on different parts of a child's clothing. Um, so he or she will have to feel them, locate them, cross midline, and occasionally adjust or stabilize their clothing while removing um, the clothespin or sticker with the other. So that's a really good um, dressing activity without actually working on dressing. Um, playing Simon Says games help can also help with dressing. So you can have your child imitate various new postures with his or her body. And you could increase the challenge and improve strength and spatial relationships by incorporating a ball or a stuffed animal. So that's been a popular one that I've been doing right now. It's just having the child um, not only play Simon Says, but include their favorite um, their favorite animal. And I ha might have them hold it between their knees or hold it between their elbows or on top of their head. And, um, and it becomes pretty fun. Um, we can also use beaded necklaces, hula hoops, large rings, scrunchies, and have them place um, those items over their head, over their leg, over their shoulder, over their hand. Um, if you also want to work on kind of having your child discriminate the right or left side, you can make it trickier that way and, and calling out the uh, side of the body. Um, and then we'll play a lot of games that encourage trunk rotation and reaching behind um, if we're working on toileting management. So I'll have families just play their their favorite game. If it might be a card game or um, any type of game and place the game pieces under the child's body or behind them so that they have to rotate their trunk a little bit in order to retrieve them. Um, another fun one that some of the kids really enjoy is um, if we're working on some wiping and toileting um, activities include placing a sticky substance such as peanut butter or frosting on a plate, balloon or ball and have your child practice wiping it off with toilet paper. Um, we can even increase the challenge by having them sit on something uh, like a ball and having a reach behind them. Katrina, are you there? Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, okay, hi, Katrina. Hi. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, 
Okay, so first, um, so hi, my name's Katrina Sanchez. I'm one of the speech language pathologists at Napa. Um, and so today I will be talking a little bit about some home exercises you can do. So initially, um, I like to talk about maximizing the environment. So some sensory considerations um, that help improve attention and participation at home would include visual and auditory um, and some different positioning uh, strategies. So for visual, I would say make sure to, um, when you're setting the child up, you wanna make sure that your vis the, their vision is clear with no clutter. So you want a clutter-free space. Um, sometimes having them face a wall is helpful. Um, and keeping toys hidden away. So try not to have toys all over and out and about. That could be visually distracting. Um, for kids with visual impairments, like cortical vision impairment, uh, doing a simple or plain background. You can have high contrast. Often I'll uh, turn off the lights and use light toys and things like that to help gain the child's attention a little bit better or using the child's anchor color, which uh, a lot of kids with cortical vision impairment or just different vision impairments in general often have a specific color that they're more attracted to that they're able to see um, better. So using that color somehow within the activity often can have the child direct their attention over to the activity. In terms of auditory input, having a quiet space. So keeping in mind, you wanna to try to avoid having the TV on and having too much sound in the background or cooking, cleaning, things like that. Try to keep it to a minimum um, unless it's just part of the activity, but anything else you'd like to try to keep that lower. Oftentimes I'll notice kids, even in session, if they're hearing something outside, um, I can, I can see it seems like they're processing, but they're actually just thinking about the sound outside rather than what I was talking about. So keeping that in mind. Um, and then for positioning, the major rule to focus on when you're having a child sit, whether it be on a couch or in a chair, whatever you're having them sit in, you wanna look for a 90, 90 degree angle. So you would have the child supported where their ankles are at a 90 degree angle, their hips are at a 90 degree angle, um, and their knees are at a 90 degree angle. So kind of like in these pictures that I'm showing you, um, having the most support would provide you with those angles. Um, and some supports that you can use at home because oftentimes in clinic we have really nice high supportive chairs and at home those could be tricky to have sometimes. So using pool noodles, uh, rolled up towels, or non-slip shelf liners are helpful. I will put the liner underneath their, um, underneath their butt to kind of avoid them slipping or sliding down their chair. Using pool noodles on the sides to help support keep them straight up in their chair. Or the same with rolled towels under their arms um, or on their sides to help keep them well supported. You can, um, putting a footrest, sometimes I'll put a box or something under their feet if the footrest is not big enough for the child to maintain their feet on. So having a footrest will help you keep that 90 degree angle and a tray or table so that you can put activities on and it helps support the child's arms if they're using a switch or if they're using a device or if they're just using their arms to play. And of course for parent seating, uh, you just want to be make sure you're within the child's visual field, either in front of them or next to them, whatever is easier for their vision. And if they have a preference in vision for right or left side, make sure you keep that in mind when you're sitting on one side or another and you're presenting an activity. Okay, so now we'll go to the next slide. Let's see. Okay. Uh, bear with me, I am on a different slide here. Okay, so um, for during activities, the kind of how the other girls were saying that it's hard to figure out, you know, when to focus on these things when everybody has their lives going on and some other kids running around and things happening. So when do you have the time? I would pick one or two times a day to set a routine. Um, so it can be just 10 or 15 minutes. That's more than enough um, 
and make it something that's part of your daily schedule. That's usually when I found the most success when parents can find, you know, I included their speech practice during snack time or during our daily reading time. You can include during bath time or during their scheduled play time. So something like that will also help parents remember when to incorporate that way it keep it holds you more accountable um and so pick one to two when you're working on activities the best idea is to pick one or two focused core words that you want to work on or different communication targets whatever that may be for your activity so keep it easy for you and it helps your it keeps it easy for you i'm sorry and it helps your child feel more successful when you focus on just one or two things versus um, multiple within a 10 to 15 minute time. And by all means, you can go over 10 to 15 minutes, the more the merrier, but um, at least doing 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, you wanna try to keep the pressure minimum. Remembering modeling is key. So I often tell families, if you can model when you're first working on any communication strategy, uh, Modeling what the child needs to do first is key. I would say to model 80% of the time and let the child do the, uh, the remaining 20% when they're first learning a new skill. And then it provides them with a rich language input, which is really vital for communication. Okay, and some examples for communication targets would include um, before, so if the child isn't speaking or doesn't have words on their device or verbally, I would work on including some reaching or eye gaze activities to make choices. You can also start to work on yes and no responses, whether that may be verbally saying yes or no, or having the child raise their hand for yes or shake or nod for yes. Um, a lot of kiddos I have found have a trouble have trouble nodding for yes if they have different motor impairments. Um, so either having them raise their hand or or showing you in a different way, even if it's to start with a smile, um, you can work from there and start to implement other ways of of telling you yes or no, hitting a switch or learning some cause and effect as well. If they're at the one to two word level, you can use start focusing on more core words. And by core words, I mean um, words that we use all the time in our daily routines that are so common that are often first words like more, stop, all done, go, hello, play, on, turn, or mine. And then if your child's at a sentence level, I would focus on one targeted goal area at a time. So you can maybe focus on answering questions at, or sentence structure. And if you're focusing more so on speech, meaning how the child is pronouncing or saying their sounds, I would try starting with one speech sound to work on at a time. You want to give lots and lots of modeling, of course, um, of the correct sound and incorporate that sound into play if possible. Um, there's, I have further information about prompting and things like that. If if anybody needs any ideas on how to prompt their child with, if they're working on certain sounds, um, just comment later at the end of the session, and we can discuss that a little bit more as well. And we'll go to the next slide. Okay. So what materials should I use for all of this? Toys and activities that allow your child to take turns, um, make communication exchanges, ask for help, making a choice, or hear, hear and use different types of words. So this sounds, a bit, I think it sounds a bit obvious at first, but when you actually try to think about it, sometimes we run out of ideas and we end up doing the same activities over and over. So getting creative and thinking outside of the box, um, you know, not all toys like are created equal. So choosing motivating toys that stimulate communication or choice making and goal targets. Um, you can also, so like I said, rather than just picking specific same activities, you can do activities that if your child needs physical support to do it, by all means, go ahead and, and do pretend foods, feeding a puppet. Uh, you can use words like, like how you see in the picture there, uh, rich language where you can talk about the flavors of things, you can talk about what you do with them, different verbs, you can have the child ask for help, 
um, or, or just talk about colors and different basic concepts. And um, another one of my favorites, uh, often a lot of my kids really, really love listening to music. So I will use my iPhone and just turn on music for them. But rather than just playing the music and letting them listen and ask for more or to stop, I have them comment if they like it, if I'll lower the volume and ask them to use the word up or to turn it up. Um, and then I raise the volume again. You can have them use different verbs like play or stop and describing um, like this is good or it's bad. So continuing to think outside of the box of what else can we say about these simple activities and even incorporating new activities that you thought maybe it would be difficult for your child, you can start to incorporate for them. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. All right. Um, and so a, a, I, I would say a lot of families that I see you know, they're about to head back home and they're saying, you know, if I'm, if their child is about to use a device or we've been trialing a device or we're thinking about a certain communication system that a child's going to use and they don't have that system just yet. I think across the board, um, having a child be able to make choices, whether it's verbal or using a device, um, there's partner assisted, assisted scanning as a great method that I think anybody can do even without a device or anything like that. So I'll explain a little bit of how that works now. So especially for a child who's nonverbal or minimally verbal, turn these opportunities provide a child with turn taking and social exchanges. Um, they let a ch your child initiate a conversation or making a choice. They give them more independence. Um, they allow opportunities to hear different vocabulary, different words, so they're growing in their language and um, often increases cooperation as well. Okay, so um, so first you would start with, let's say, it's a, we would say like, what's on the menu? So number one, ask a question. You're gonna ask your child, let's say, you know, what color shirt um, should you wear today? So again, thinking of different opportunities where you can have your child play or, or respond or so you're going to ask your child what color shirt do you want to wear today um, and then you're going to give your choices but you're not going to expect a response just yet so if you you just want to limit to two to three choices you want red or blue let's say and then um, next you would tell them how to respond so if your child doesn't know how to respond or doesn't know what you're looking for in a response you would tell them okay you can you know you can tell me with your voice you can raise your right arm you can push your button and that'll tell me yes um, and then from there you would provide the choices and slowly give the choices with about five to 10 seconds between, looking for that response that you just told them. So for example, you can tell me by moving your arm, wait five seconds, um, and then give the next option and wait again. If they're not giving you a response, you can try it again or give them that verbal feedback of, oh, I'm not sure, let's try again. So I would accept any attempt or possible response, even if you are not sure if it was 100% um, intentional, you can go with it. Oh, I saw you moving your arm. Okay, that means you want more. That means you want to choose blue, whatever you're working on. Um, and then you want to make sure and reinforce that and provide them feedback. So praise the child and, and continue moving forward with that response and, and provide that feedback. So we'll go to the next. Okay. Um, okay. Can um, you see that, Katrina? Yes, not the one that has the different pictures of wait time. Other, other tips for success? Yes, that one. Thank you. Okay. So okay. Yeah. these um so I would say these are kind of like our nice rule of thumb, like tips for success. So wait time is key. Like I was saying before, wait five to 10 seconds whenever you're giving a child um, any cues, whether it be trying to work on speech sounds or giving choices. Waiting, I would say, is one of the biggest things that families forget because we're in such a hurry to find a response or to get a, to get a response or ask them more questions. 
just if you wait sometimes five to 10 seconds, even though it could feel uncomfortable, some, it'll allow your child to process the information. And um, it reminds me of like when you're trying, trying to tell your child to say goodbye to someone and you tell them a hundred times. And then finally, when you're leaving out the door is when the child starts waving, saying goodbye. So just wait a little longer and it allows the child to process what you are asking. Um, modeling, I can't stress that enough. So instead of telling the child, say this, say that, say this, instead try to minimize that as much as humanly possible and encourage them by just modeling what you want them to say. And, and oftentimes the pressure is so low that they'll end up doing it. Um, and if they don't, then try it again the next time and, and eventually the child will start to, to imitate. Um, the two to one rule, two comments for every question. So instead of asking so many questions when you're reading a book, try to comment throughout and provide that language input. Uh, next would be adjusting your support level. So remember not to give your child too much support and, and helping them do everything to the max. Often when you give that wait time, you could kind of see where they're at. And if you need to help them a little bit more, a little bit less, you can adjust as you need. And then last but not least, following through based on what they said or picked. So remembering that each word has a unique meaning. Even if you're asking your child, um, you know, do you want the blue or the red shirt? And they say green. You know, instead of ignoring that, you can always say, oh, did you want a green shirt? Oh, that's not a choice right now. But we have blue and yellow right now or whatever the choices were. Um, just make sure to give them that feedback and know that they were understood or they were heard and you can um, have some fun with that. So it keeps the child's trust as well and to know that they're you're listening to them. And I believe that is it. Okay, so now we will take our questions. So thank you for spending time listening to us this evening. Yes, if y'all want to use that chat feature, then just type in your questions and they can read them and answer them. That would be great. Or you can turn off your camera or and just say them out loud. It's fine. Okay. I um, I do see somebody on the screen. Is that okay? If somebody's camera is on. It's definitely better if they turn their camera off, but I can just stop if, if their camera is on. Okay. Um, do you know what I actually, oh, here we go. Here's the comments. Is it under the chat? It is. I don't think anyone said any questions. Okay. This. Okay. okay, great. So maybe you guys were super thorough. You're we very clear. <laughs> <laughs> we'll wait a few more minutes and see if people are typing in their questions or make comments and I can definitely turn off the recording if someone just wants to say something and have their camera on. Oh, I did get a text from someone who can't say anything and she said that, um, can they explain the Napa Center and who is appropriate for intensive therapy? Good point. Sure. Um, so, oh, sorry, Katrina, did you want to go? No, no, go ahead. Okay. Okay. So um, the Napa Center is a physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy clinic. Um, we see kids um, kind of all across the board, all ages from um, the youngest we take for an intensive is going to be about 10 months, but we prefer a little bit older than that. Um, so 10 months to, I have a girl that's 22 now. So um, kind of all across the board. And really there are some things that we call red flags that we may not, that may not make your child appropriate for intensive therapy. But we have on our website, um, just www.napacenter.org. Um, there is a form that you can fill out and then our team takes a look and just um, screens your child for if they're appropriate or not for um, the intensive program. And to be honest, most kids are, but there, again, like I said, there are a few things that, that are cause for um, not being appropriate candidate for an intensive. Um, I do see a, 
Another question, can you explain more about the joint compressions? Erin, do you wanna take that one? Sure. Yes, I can explain more about the joint compressions. Um, so essentially what you would do, and typically these are done, um, as I mentioned before, uh, we like to do them kind of at the start of the session in preparation to prepare their bodies. Um, but essentially you can, in general, we provide them to the upper extremities and the lower extremities. And I would just place my hand, I typically will start more proximal and move more distal. So that meaning starting closer to the center of the body and moving um, out away from the body. So I would start at the shoulder and um, place one hand up at the top of the child's shoulder and one hand um, around the bicep basically and compress um, my hands together so that you're providing some compression to the child's um, shoulder girdle. And then from there, I would um, support above and below the child's elbow and again, compress um, my hands together to provide that compression to the child's um, joints at the, at the elbow, and then I would do the same to the wrist, and then I would do the same thing on the other side. So I do the shoulder, and in general, we tend to shoot for about 10 compressions each. So I would then move to the opposite shoulder, um, elbow, and then wrist, and then again at the wrist, I would hold um, at like basically at the forearm in the child's hand, and then kind of compress uh, my hand together, uh, my two hands together, and I tend to do this fairly slowly. So maybe one compression, um, no quicker than one compression per second, usually about a compression every two seconds. Um, you can also do this to the fingers. Um, and then we'll also do this to the lower extremities. So I'll put, put one hand at the hip and one hand at the thigh and compress my hands together to provide that input to the child's thigh. Um, same thing at the knee. One, I put one hand above and below the knee, compress those um, my hands together at the knee joint, and then um, I would do the same thing at the ankle. Um, so place one hand at the foot, one hand at the ankle, and then compress into, into the ankle joint. Um, and then I would do the same thing on the other side. Uh, we also do like to couple of this a lot of times if families have a um, sensory brush or, or a surgical scrub brush, um, those pair nicely together um, by providing a lot of that organizing deep pressure input. So a lot of times we'll have families um, do the do a brushing um, technique and then administer those joint compressions. 